Hi, I'm Dapper Dan, and welcome to the Web3 Fundamentals course. You're probably here because you've heard something about Web3, maybe some little bits like Ethereum or smart contracts, but you don't know how these, all these concepts connect. And that's what this course will help you with. So we'll take a tour of the world of Web3 and see how it's changing the way we work and develop technology in a decentralized way. Our first stop is to define what is Web3 and what is it different to any other versions of the web. So let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the first lesson of this Web3 Fundamentals course. This wouldn't be a Web3 Fundamentals course if we didn't take some time to actually define what Web3 is. And that's probably a big question that's been on your mind and why you kind of started this course in the first place. Because you've probably seen things about Web3, some of the major promises of it changing society or at least how we interact or transact with others. So really let's dig deep into what Web3 is by basically defining what Web3 isn't first. So if you look at different definitions of the web and how it's structured and different versions, we see this like Web2, Web Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 formula. And I really like this. It's very clean to describe. Many people have claimed that they were the originator of this sort of definition. I don't know who to give the direct credit to, but if we look at the concepts and ideas there, I think it's a really great place to start. Because one, we have Web 1 as the, the early version of the web. So this is kind of like your early 1990s type of website where you were super excited just to get some sort of static HTML page up so people could read whatever you're writing, whether that is a, a news site or maybe you want to share your interest in sports or your hobbies. This was super popular back then and not so easy to do. So it makes sense that people were very excited to be able to write and write something and share something to the internet. But then we moved on to web two, which was how we sort of divine read and write. So not only were these platforms that are developing uh, that were allowing us to post things um, and just have a static page, but now we could also contribute directly. So we can make user generated content. We could share it at a different scale that we've never seen before. You can think of things like YouTube, which is a, a platform, but now people are enabling content creators to make content and share it and really write to the internet, if you will. And then now this movement is going now to Web3, which is about read, write and own. And I think that's a really exciting part is the own part of Web3. And yes, you know, it's exciting. It gets people going. But do we really know what that means? Do we just sort of leave that as own and, and have everyone sort of define it? I think the best place to look for actually explaining what we mean by own is one of the core concepts of Web3. And that is decentralization. So you had different types of networks that we've operated before in. And if you look at the current web or web two, if you will, uh, it operates on a very centralized basis. So you're probably viewing this page on a centralized server or this video where, you know, it's hosted somewhere, let's say in, in a, someone's server, a Google server, a YouTube server, and it's being directly served to you on the internet and into your devices. And that's really great. It provides some benefits that we'll talk about in, in the future. But in the other hand, we have a decentralized network where we ha can have this video basically hosted in multiple different nodes or different devices spread across the network where they're all interconnected and they all agree that this is the video that you should be watching. And then they're able to serve that video to whoever is requesting it. So in this case, we don't need to rely on any sort of centralized source for this type of information, but we can connect to different nodes and we make sure that these nodes are aligned. We'll definitely go into way more detail in this course about how these nodes sort of align and agree to the data, but just know that this is the power of decentralization. When, when you're able to distribute information and data across the network that allows it to be able to connect, then we can do different things around incentivizing content creators and rewarding those uh, content creators or whoever's building this data, as well as build products that utilize this type of network in a better way. Because if you look at it now, one of the major benefits has been a lot of these larger tech companies where we have centralized services. So you can think of the bigger companies, maybe a Google, Twitter, or Meta, or we have all these great social media platforms out there where they're in a centralized, centralized source, but it allows us to operate at a massive scale. So whenever I sh send a tweet, 
uh, you know, all my viewers or my um, followers can receive that. Or even on Facebook, if I share something, I can do that as well. And now it's reliable, it's always there, and it's convenient. And not only are we talking about sort of the major tech companies that are out there, but even some of the ones we probably don't think of as centralized services also provide that sort of value. Where, you know, if I want to make a blog post, uh, Medium's a great centralized source, I can conveniently post something and reach an audience. Or if I was a musician or even a newsletter writer, I can do those similarly with Spotify and Substack. But what we have found and what has actually been growing in Web3 is actually alternative to these, these versions. And we will go into more about the benefits of why we would make these services Web3 native. But let's look at this. So instead of maybe having like an Amazon Web Services where you're tied to you know, the pricing and uptime of Amazon, we can use things like Arweave, which is a file distribution or file uh, data management network that allows these the data that you assign to it or send to it to last basically forever because it's on a distributed network. And a distributed network doesn't necessarily need to go down because there's no single source. There's no, oh, we've pulled the plug on Amazon or things like that where you might have in other systems. So. It's an absolute amount of benefit for anyone making or utilizing applications uh, or data where they need to have this sort of permanent storage. And a, another version of these things is even if we talk about accessing t the internet. Well, you know, before you had to type in you know the IP address of every website, and then we had a different service like uh, DNS. Uh, we registered on uh, thing registered on registries like GoDaddy, and that was super simple. But even on the Web3 side now, we have a replacement of that called Ethereum name, sys name system, where we can use ENS, as it's sh shortened for, uh, to access websites, access addresses, and it basically is resolving all of those large, annoying things to type uh, in a simple and convenient way for users to interact with. And on the content creative side, which I'm very passionate about, we have things like Medium uh, on the Web2 side, where it's, you post some things, it's great to uh, monetize those things and build an audience. But if I were to leave Medium, I would need to carry that audience and hope that the audience comes with me into a new platform where if I use something like Mirror, which is the sort of Web3 equivalent of that, one, people can directly tip me or um, send me funds directly to my wallet based on each other article. And the, the platform itself is uh, just not owning my content, uh, but displaying the content because the content lives on chain. We'll talk a little bit more about that that what on chain means as well. But as you can see, there's quite been a lot of momentum and movement in the Web3 space to make alternatives that work in a decentralized way. But that begs the question, right? I'm sure you're viewing at home. What are the benefits of decentralization and why do you keep saying that? Well, if you look at centralization and decentralization, and I'll take a really sort of non-biased approach to this. Centralization, I mean, does offer high speeds, right? We're connecting directly to a server that's probably replicated and it's optimized for the most amount of efficiency and bandwidth in the nearest server that's uh, closest to me and distributing that information in the fastest ways possible. So in that way, even on the performance side, it performs better than uh, most decentralized networks. Uh, but there is a single source of truth and that's um, one of the uh, one of the disadvantages to centralization because then we also introduce ourselves to a single failure point. So if one for if that that single server the centralized server goes down, and even if you have mechanisms to replicate that, um, this single source and single failure point uh, can lead to a distribution of services. It's also censorable. And I think a lot of people don't consider that because they think, you know, if you're removed from a platform or you get your content removed from YouTube, you must be doing something um, that's misaligned with the company's goals. And that can happen, but these companies' goals change. And maybe you've incidentally posted something with a, a, a music video and your content gets uh, removed. So in that way, there needs to be a way for content creators to operate in a better environment uh, where they can uh, feel like they can, one, express or post different content and not actually get that content removed. So in this way, it's also a permission required. Centralization, again, there's normally someone owning a platform or owning the server, and you need to adhere to some sort of standards or rules or operations uh, for them to be able to use, for you to be able to use their resources. 
on the decentralized side of things, yes, there is a longer travel time for data because again, we're operating amongst different connected nodes and those nodes need to be in sync and agree or come to a consensus on the data. Uh, and there's also maybe even lower performance as far as uh, again, speed, um, as well as delivery of those types of types of data that you might be working with. But it's a protocol led, a led system where a protocol having a set so set of rules and standards makes all of the governing uh, as well as the op leading of all the operations of a network. So there's no single point of failure uh, because again, to able to take down a distributed or decentralized network would require you to take down at least all of the nodes because there's still a replication of all of the data with them. And then it's uncensorable and permissionless. No one necessarily owns uh, the data or owns the platform. It's all on chain and committed, and you can always retrieve the data and distribute it in ways that you would like to, to have. So again, from a, both a content and transaction standpoint, not having a central authority to govern or make rules, but have a protocol or code to de define the law is beneficial in many different use cases. And in the way of decentralization, what are the, the byproducts of this? What is, does it actually have to bring? Uh, what, what can we do with this new system? And we can build things called dApps or decentralized applications. So these are very similar to applications that you might have been working with or used before, whether it's a front end website, maybe a mobile site as well. But instead of using a centralized database, it actually connects to the blockchain as a backend. And again, using all the powers that we just talked about of decentralization of a decentralized network, uh, we can bring in new different types of services and reward creators, reward uh, um, bring the value closer to those uh, who are creating it. We also have DeFi. So again, one of the biggest use cases of a centralization as far as uh, having a centralized authority is banks. Banks get to decide things like interest rates, they get to decide who gets loans, who doesn't, all these, these things that really control our day-to-day -day lives. But in the world of DeFi or decentralized finance, instead of having a centralized bank do that, we can have a smart contract govern these sorts of mechanisms. So we don't have any uh, you know, bias or any um, you know, di direct data around there where we can now trade and even do money of the financial systems like get loans uh, without having a bank decide those th sorts of things. We have DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations, which are essentially, uh, instead of having a top-down hierarchy of a, a company that decides, oh, these are the rules and policies, we have a group of individuals that are assigned to a common goal and share a common treasury or a bank account, and they use smart contracts to define what and how those projects get funded. And again, the two main pillars that we'll go way more into depth in this course is around blockchain. What is a blockchain? How does it work? And smart contracts. Like I've mentioned before, a smart contracts, much like a regular contract would be to an ingredients of different parties, a smart contract is written in code and completely automated. So it self-executes and we don't need to have a someone to sort of push the button or say when or how people can get loans, what projects can get funded, or what applications and data that we can share. So this is the journey we're going to take in this course. First, we're going to answer the question of what is a blockchain? Again, this is probably the pillar of what we're going to be talking about further more in this course. So it's a great question to answer. Then we'll look at some of the popular blockchains out there. There are quite a different, different flavors and we'll see what sort of approaches that they have taken. Then we'll look at consensus models. And like I said, the trickiest part of a blockchain or a decentralized network is getting all the, the nodes or participants to agree. And this is actually done by consensus modeling. Then we'll look at the blockchain trilemma, which is an interesting topic because it, it sort of explains why we have multiple different blockchains. How do they weigh and prioritize different things uh, and why they own the benefits of e either or. Then we'll look at what are dApps. So dApps, again, the decentralized applications, we'll look at how they're made, how what they can do, and how you can start creating them yourself. Then we'll look at different token types. Uh, tokens are one of the main ways to sort of either reward 
or the kind of currency of uh, Web3. So we'll look at how those structured and uh, how they the origins of them as well. Then we'll look at what is DeFi. Like I said, decentralized finance is one of the bigger use cases for Web3. So we'll dip, uh, d dig deep into how those um, mechanisms work. And then what are DAOs? Really the structures of DAOs, uh, what are pop some popular DAOs and different types of DAOs that you even listening can join today. And then we'll leave you with two roadmaps. One more of a technical developer roadmap on what could be next for you in your journey of Web3. And then a non-developer a non roadmap, which will still be quite involved with Web3 and these concepts, but again, take you along the journey to the next steps of your Web3 world. So that's a lot of information and a lot of things we need to cover. So I'll see you in the next one.